Well, hi everyone. Welcome to Love at First Laugh, the Green Room Edition. And today I have a wonderful guest. I've known her for years and she is a kick ass. I mean, she's inspiring. She always inspired me and encouraged me to pursue my dreams. She is the author of Create Your Yes. I mean, how much more positive than that can you get? She's amazing. Oh, and she wrote the movie A Christmas for Mary, which aired on OWN, Opera's Network, which I put lifetime, but I'm calling that into existence because nothing, the sky's the limit with Angela. She's amazing. Please welcome Angela Hutchinson. Yay. Hey, I'm so excited. Yes, I'm all about the existence, putting it into existence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So I did that for you. So next thing you know, you're going to be on Lifetime. There you go. Listen, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, that's like the next logical step for you, I think. Well, yeah, because I, I love Christmas movies, you know, and Lifetime does a lot of Christmas movies. Um, and I'm actually, I did, I have been, I recently worked with a producer that's done a lot of Hallmark movies. So I'm also trying to navigate over there too. So I'm all about, you know, Women empowerment. <laughs> yes, I love it. Um, so, well, of course, I'm going to ask you, my first question is going to be like, what propelled you to write the book? Create your yes. Well, you know what? Because I, so the full title is Create Your Yes When You Keep Hearing No. And so I basically just got tired of hearing no a lot. And I realized <laughs> that basically I've become an expert in hearing no and then also how to navigate it. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I actually got that book deal is I was invited to do a TEDx talk and the TEDx talk was on breaking barriers. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to think of, you know, what kind of barriers have I broken? Some as a woman, some as a black woman, some as a black person, some as a mom, I have three little kids, some as a, as a wife, I've been married for 18 years, a lot of barriers. Oh there, right? <laughs> we can talk about that because you need to give me the tea. That'll be a whole nother podcast. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely a whole different, that's another podcast. We can talk about that. But. So, but I was trying to think of, okay, all the barriers are broken. What is something that everybody can relate to no matter who you are? Mm -hmm. And I was like, rejection. Because yeah. no matter if you're a celebrity or you are a college student or you are mid-level exec, no matter what you are facing, you have faced rejection and you'll also continue to face it as long as you live. You're going to get rejected at some point and you're going to give rejection too. You're going to give oh, yeah. it. We don't ever talk about that, but we do a lot of giving of rejection to other people as well. So I was like, this is a good topic. Yes, that's, oh, absolutely. We're going to go to that. I just want to ask you some more questions before we, I have questions, very specific questions on how yes, to let's dive your, in. Yes. We all want to know. Uh, so, I'm, you know, you're very positive and I love that. And I always wonder with people like you who are like, just go getters and don't stop. <laughs> Because you never stop. Uh, how do I love you? Like, wait, why do you say people like you? Like we're so like like we're from another planet or something. You're like, yes. people like <laughs> I love it. You are from a great planet, so we want to find out what your planet is like. Uh, so have you ever wanted to quit? And if so, did you? How did you keep going? I wanted to quit like yesterday, like literally, <laughs> like I mean, last week, like every, every other, listen, if we had my mother on here, she'd be like, okay, like I have, I still to this day, even with like success that I've gotten, um, like just a couple weeks ago, I signed another deal for um, a, for a crime show that I'm developing. And so it's like, you know, as opportunities come, I sign with a literary agent as opportunities come, I think for me, not everybody, but you still just become a little bit insecure. They're like, well, well, right. wait, what if, what if, what, wait, am I really, am I a good writer? Am I okay? Like, I don't know, but what, you know, what if I'm not? What if, what if they just, what if it's just this one? What if it's just the one hit? You know what I mean? So I think um, doubt for me, at least it comes, it comes often. And I often feel like I want to quit, but I think I've gotten to a place now where um, I think that sort of what, what makes me know that I cannot and I have to keep going is, um, is because I'm doing this for something greater than myself. And so, you know, I'm trying to inspire other people to help them to achieve their dreams. And if I quit, then how, what will that say to the other person who's also feeling like they can't make it? So especially for women, especially for moms. And so it, it becomes harder when you add 
layers of things into your life. If you're taking care of a sick one or if you yourself are sick, there's just layers of things that come onto us. And so I just feel like I can't quit at this point because I have to continue to be a beacon of light for other people. But it's hard. Listen, <laughs> I love that. You know, you're connected to a higher mission, which I believe that when we're connected to a higher mission, uh, my my mission, I feel, is to love and help others, which is kind of like what you do uh, in a different I do it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I feel like coming from that place, everything falls into place and everything is easier if if you come from a place of a spiritual place or, or a more uh, a higher level place. Do yeah. You feel that, that keeps you going. Absolutely. I mean, for me, I'm a Christian. So, you know, God is my source of, mm -hmm. of power, my source. But I think even if you, no matter what, no matter what religion you are, I think it's just important to tap into something higher than yourself and giving purpose to your, not so much. I mean, it's good to give like a big, a big vision purpose, but also just the day to day. Like I really try to have a purpose each day when I wake up at 520 in the morning, I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> what am I trying to, what, what is my purpose today? Like, what am I trying to do? Is it to make sure I get all my doctor's appointments done? Is it like, what is the purpose for today for my world? And then what am I, what am I contributing to other people? Mm -hmm. um, and I either try to do that in a big way, whether it's sending an email to people or it's in a small way, texting a mentor. I mean, a mentee. Hey, you know, can I help you with something or what are you working on or, you know, whatever it might be. So I think having a mission and just, you know, a vision for what it is you want to do is really important because without that, there's just first of all, in the world that we're living right now, everything is so saturated. There's so much coming at us, so much social media. Oh Yes. Yes. Podcast. It's just, it's just, it's so much. It's so it's overwhelming. You're just like, oh my yeah. gosh, Woo. This is a lot. <laughs> I know. How, how do we deal with that? You know? So it, I think having a mission is like the best way to deal with it. Regardless of the outcome, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And, and, and you were not, I, I remember before, you know, early on in my career, I was hung up on results and now I'm more hung up, yeah. not hung up, but I'm like all about, I do what I do regardless of the results. But in your book, you talk about getting results. We're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, results are good. But I think, I think to your point, progress is important. You know, yes. it's not so much the end. It's just like just getting from like to the end of the week. Like that is progress. Like you make it to the end of the week and you're still like at the gym or you're still, you know, can happily drink your cup of coffee or, you know, whatever it is you enjoy doing when you can do that by Friday, that's, that is like, ha that's a happy time. You should celebrate that moment. You know, we don't celebrate enough of our small, small successes. We're always looking for those big things, but it's the small mm -hmm. successes that allow us to get to those big things. Absolutely. Um, wh what are you grateful for? Because being grateful is I think really important, right? That's to be everything. Every day. Everything. Yeah, that's I mean, being grateful is just is everything. I'm always, you know, really telling my children how important it is to be grateful for I'm a really big on listen, even if you don't like the meal I'm serving you, um, when I put that meal down, you need to say thank you. To me, you need to say thank you to God, even if you don't like the meal. So and I and they have to remind me too, did you pray? Did you did you say, Oh no, I forgot to say my grace? Okay, let me do that. But so I try to I have a little um a little journal um that my daughter bought me called I think it's says a uh, express espresso yourself like you know coffee espresso yourself and yeah. in there i try to you know every other night whenever i think about it to write down one thing that i'm really grateful for that day and mm -hmm. so sometimes it's the same thing sometimes it's family sometimes it's just life sometimes it's just creativity i think that's one of my um things i really enjoy to be able to create something um mm -hmm. some of the gifts that i feel like i have so i'm grateful for those things but you know i think when it really comes down to it it's just like my mental health is is big i think mental health i mm -hmm. learned during covid how important your mental health is oh and my god so, yeah. right and so i'm so grateful to have yeah. that and to better understand myself and other people around me. So that is something I'm really grateful for. I love it. Here's uh, Marty. We're going to be taking comments from the yes. <laughs> listeners. He says, at my age, waking up is progress. He's 81. <laughs> He's a good friend of mine. <laughs> Listen, it is. Seriously, right? You got You have to be grateful for whatever it is. That is no small thing. <laughs> like, yeah. seriously. Because sometimes just getting out of bed is like, oh. I know. And all those negative thoughts like, oh, no, I got to do this. And I got to do that. And what? Yeah. And you got to. I have those. You know, sometimes when I wake up and it's like, you got to just delete them. Like, tick, 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 delete. Because if not, they're going to haunt you for the rest of the day. 
Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, you have to restart. It's like a new day is a chance to just refresh, yes. restart. You know, and that's one of the things too. I'm really grateful for to be around my children a lot because they teach mm -hmm. me that a lot too. They're so resilient. You know, I think I had a harder time with the pandemic than they did. They're just so really? resilient. Like, oh, okay, we're gonna do Zoom. This is cool. I'm like, cool. This is this is not cool. <laughs> like, I mean, at first it was cool. Then I was like, okay, this is this is too long, too long to be cool. Like you need to be back in that classroom. You know what I mean? But they're yes. so resilient. They like pick up on how to do things. And so, you know, I, I learned a lot for them how to uh, be grateful. That's amazing. We can learn from children. Yeah. <laughs> sure. They're wiser than we are. Sometimes uh, this is true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're not gonna admit it to them, but they are. Right. <laughs> Yeah, never. Uh, so here's Nate. How did you deal with rejection early in your career? Uh, did it motivate you? I think earlier, early in my career, rejection was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, I went to school for engineering, which is something totally different than what I do now. Oh, and, wow. so, yeah, and so as an engineer, I thought I was like super smart. You know, when I first moved to L.A., I was like, please, I'm killing this. Like, this is Hollywood. Like, please, whatever. Like, I'm an engineer. I have an engineering degree. This is going to be so simple. Oh, my goodness. I did not realize. Right. So yeah. really on, I think rejection really, you know, really um, hit me hard, harder than it does now. Um, and then I think. But but early on in about 2005, which is when I started my organization, Breaking to Hollywood, and that was sort of the thing where I understood how important it is that when you feel rejected, that the like one of the best ways to overcome rejection is trying to create yeses for other people. Because if you start joining other people's crews, volunteering, giving notes to people, you know, helping people in whatever way you can that's in our industry, the more you can do that, the more you will naturally become fulfilled and things will just start opening up. Things will start just, you know, opening up for you in, in, in certain ways. And so, you know, um, that's that's sort of how I dealt with it. So I think now yeah. I'm very much now I'm very much motivated by no's and no's really do just like it's just kind of like, OK, you need so many no's in order to get to where you're trying to go. Like you you need the no's in order for me to have the book creator. Yes, I wouldn't be able to have that book deal had I not been rejected enough to understand what what rejection is. And how do you redirect that rejection? Like, I wouldn't even know how to do that. So the no's are not a bad thing. We need no's in our life, period. We do. Absolutely. And they make us stronger. Absolutely. And smarter. They and do. Not, yeah. And they keep us humble, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, they do. They Absolutely. They do. They keep you yeah. humble, uh, you know, and I've learned some great lessons along the way. That's for sure. Definitely. And and you mentioned breaking into Hollywood, which is how I met you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, breaking into Hollywood if people want to join and yeah. what it's about, the mission? Because it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Breaking into Hollywood is a, is a nonprofit organization that I started in 2005. And we basically help, you know, entertainment professionals break into the entertainment industry. So we do Q&As with um, executives. Breaking into Hollywood.org is a website. You can go on there at the very bottom. You can hop on our email list. Um, and our next event is in a couple of weeks. It's with um, Brad. Uh, oh, my goodness. Um, Bradley Cooper's um, production company. Yes, uh, yes. that is so, so cool. Yes, I'm really on the board, guys. Yeah, Grace is on the board of Breaking the news. <laughs> I got the news. That is so amazing. Uh, I yeah, actually got that. Through breaking into Hollywood, I met people from Showtime, from from OWN, from like all these incredible networks, and you get a chance to talk to them. Like, you know, when we go back to meeting in a yeah, normal, yeah, and it's it's amazing. It's it's like I I became friends with um, Katie from Showtime. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that's so cool! Oh, that's yeah, so cool! Oh, that's He's, cool! Yeah, yeah, and it was because of breaking into Hollywood. So. Uh, what can people do to join Breaking Into Hollywood? So go, so to, go, the to, our, go to our website, hop on our email list, and then there's also information on joining. You can join. We have individual events that are like $60 per event, or you can join for $200 for the whole year. You can come to all the events for free. Mm -hmm. um, they're all via, they're all recorded, which is great. So if you can't catch them live via Zoom, you can watch them later. And we yeah. have a lot of other free resources that are just really helpful with you know trying to establish yourself, whether you're a writer, a producer, director, actor, Pretty much, you know, you name it, we invite all kinds of agents, production executives to come and talk and share in a very intimate setting 
which is yeah. really great. So you can get your questions answered and things like that. But, you know, starting breaking into Hollywood, the, actually the the weekend where I started it, I had gotten into a place in my own life where I felt like I was just like, I felt like I was at, at rock bottom. I just felt like I was not where I was supposed to be. I was doing everything right and nothing was was panning out. I knew all these people and just nothing was happening. And um, and I remember talking to my mom and, I, and she was like, what are you doing to give back in, 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 in the community? And I was like, oh, I do mentoring. I help girls in my church. I do things. She said, no, but what are you doing to give back in the entertainment industry, which is the area where you want to be successful? And so that advice has just really stuck with me. And that's why I started breaking in Hollywood, making so I think making sure that we're giving back to our specific industry where we want to grow and be successful. That's super important. Absolutely. And it keeps you focused on others, which is so much better than being focused on ourselves. Yeah, because sometimes <laughs> focusing on yourself is too it's just too much. Like like I do a lot of career coaching and I just love coaching clients because yes. It's just great to like, I love to hear all your problems. I will work you through all your problems. One of my clients, he, one of my clients called me his career therapist, right? Because yeah. I'll like, walk you through, but don't. But if it, but if it's when it's my issues, it's like, oh my goodness. You know what I mean? It's like, let me, you know, let me. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You know? Absolutely. Here, Marty is saying, I was a salesman for 50 years before becoming a performer. So I know rejection. Yeah. Sales is one of the best, best things, right? Sales is one of the best right. things to learn. And, and pretty much that's what we're doing in the entertainment industry. In the entertainment business, we are selling ourselves. We are, you know, when you're actor, writer, producer, you're selling yourself, you're selling your brand. You are, you know, pretty much on a daily basis trying to figure out how to sell yourself to different people because everybody, you know, um, you know, when I'm pitching myself to a literary agent, that's very different than when you're trying to, you know, sell a show. Those are just so many different things. So you're always, you know, pitching and understanding how to sell something, whether it's a product, a project or yourself and why you should be the one doing the project. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about pitching, because that's a topic we have a lot of people in the entertainment industry that are listening and um, and then they download the pod uh, podcast, too. So everybody, you know, in the industry will. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people yeah. in the industry will. So uh, what is the process of pitching a show yeah. in your experience? Is, yeah. is there a particular path or is it different? I think different it's, probably di it's, probably, it's probably different for, you know, depending on what kind of show people want to pitch, but I'll speak to my experience. So I sold my very first show uh, last year to woohoo to Facebook. Um, and so it aired on Facebook watch. They bought six episodes. Nice. And, so, yeah, and so the way I did that is um, I um, was working with a production company. And mm -hmm. so I've actually had about, oh my goodness, I think I'm at like number 17 or 18 option deals with different production companies, which means Dang, that- girl. I know it's crazy. So, <laughs> insane. so insane. Um, but, but that's literally of all those, that's the only, that's one that sold. And I'm in the process of developing the crime one, right? Uh, the crime show. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're I think this one's going to go. Um, Cause it's so, nice. juicy. it's so, it's so the thing about when you're pitching something, I tried to pitch the same show some time ago. It just, the, the industry wasn't ready for it, but mm -hmm. with the way things are and just a lot of things that happen, you know, in the media, the show is, is able people are able to see it from a different perspective the show than they ever would be able to before so sometimes things are timing whether yeah. it you know something being in or cool or, or whatever it is so everything is timing um and so i think you know that's something to keep in mind when you're pitching mm -hmm. when you're pitching something you have to see how relevant it is to the times that you're in even though the show may yeah. not air for a year from now you that's mm -hmm. still important to say why is this what is what is going to like pique the interest of the people that you're pitching and I think ultimately either having a sizzle or having a pitch deck, um, you know, maybe a pilot script if if it's like a scripted um, right. series or something like that. Um, but I think I that think pretty much, a Bible yeah. also, is that important? Yeah, a story Bible. I mean, there's so many different ways. I do like one sheets. I've pitched, I've literally pitched, um, I've gotten option deals from pitching like a one sheet. I've literally, once, see, the right. thing is once you build a relationship with production yeah. company executives, they're more open to like, receiving your ideas with less, less information being presented to them. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know someone, you might have to have like a 30 page Bible and all this stuff. But once you start developing a relationship and they know, okay, who you are, your ideas are great. They just haven't found one that fits with their programming mandate. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they'll allow you to just pitch like a log line or, you know, a little paragraph in, in an image just to right. kind of the concept. 
And then, you know, um, and I've gotten production deals that way too, off of something literally like a paragraph and, a, and an image. And they were like, we love it. And they signed me a deal, you know? Now the show did not sell ultimately, but still that was, you know, still success yeah. to me because it's like, you know, getting getting option deals are very hard to do. And just because I have 17 of them, I cannot minimize that. I have to keep reminding myself. Like I know oh, they didn't have 17 deals, but they didn't all sell. But listen, keep going, Angela, because one day. <laughs> Exactly. And that's what, that was my next thought. It's like you did not give up after 17 times, you know, but, it's like and, wait. And let me say, I did give up in between there. There's times when, cause sometimes it's not even giving up. Right. It's like taking a break. Take, you exactly. Know? You need to regroup because it's so yeah. intense. That's what people don't understand about the entertainment business. It's so intense. Yeah. I remember when they pitched my sitcom and we had uh, Steve Scroban was actually the, uh, the creator and the showrunner what well, was going to be if it got picked yeah, up. Yeah. And we went to 23 pitch meetings, networks. I believe it. Uh, I believe it. Production yeah. companies, 23. Okay. Put makeup and did my hair for 23 pitch meetings. Spend a fortune. That right there. And that right there is, is, you know, thousands of dollars. Okay. To look decent. And, and after, you know, we just, you know, we had three people, three companies that were interested. Uh, and then, you know, it didn't happen. Uh, we had one creative differences. That's another thing. You can have creative differences, you know, with somebody or, um, you know, they pitch in and it's not happening. But after that, I really had to take a break because it had been so intense, like a year and a half of pitching and, and like, oh, we have a, a meeting with uh, ABC or with Disney or with this, with that. And it was just so intense because the expectations and the, oh my God, you know, like I had a pitch meeting with JLo's company. I was like, oh my God, JLo, I might meet JLo, you know, like I was so excited all the time. And then it was like deflate, inflate. And that's a, and that's a very like, you know, and it's like a balance because you don't want to lose your um your momentum and your excitement. Because if you go in there all like whatever and chilled, it's kind of like it may not happen. You know, so you don't want to use you lose your zeal, but I do think you have to take a break. So I'm a big believer in like yeah. um, when I was earlier on, I used to really kind of say like never quit, never quit. I really kind of really stuck with that messaging. But as I've you know gotten older and just understand the business and try to be more mindful about my words, I don't really mind if people um, quit in a sense because sometimes you do have to quit and it to like shift your mindset mm -hmm. and shift your thinking quitting not necessarily like permanently but you might have to permanently say you know what i'm done with this i, I can't do this anymore i cannot yes. create another reality show i'm done yes. and yes. i literally <laughs> said i'm done i was like i'm done and then some time passed some things happened some meetings occurred and it was like oh i'm back in but i literally had said i was done you know so i think it's okay to mm -hmm. quit to reshift and focus your mind doesn't mean that you're quitting it forever, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes you do need a break. That's just that's just real for your Absolutely. sanity. Absolutely, and also as a creative, you have to take breaks because you can't be creating all the time. Yeah, that's otherwise your head just <laughs> your head will explode. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's me. Like I'm literally like can't sit still. Sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, the idea is so coming. much energy. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I had a meeting with the um, with the producer, and it was like nine o'clock in the morning and he was like oh i have never seen someone have you had your coffee yet because you are way too hyper way too happy <laughs> i know i know okay, I haven't even had my, no i haven't had my coffee yet but <laughs> that is too funny but you know i always compare the creative uh process to not process but like being creative and stop being creative and taking a break to being an athlete you know when i was a competitive swimmer we trained like super hard and then two days before swim meet, we would not do anything. So our bodies mm. would recover from all that training and then be strong. So I always, every time I try to push myself, you know, like you have to keep going. Yes, you have to keep going. But now it's like a week of taking a break. So you can, yeah. do it, right? You need that. So you need that. We we do. We need that. And, and, and I think it gives you the, you know, the, the energy to kind of keep going. So you definitely need to recharge just like, you know, anything else in life has to be refueled in order to keep going. That's just, that's how our bodies were made to rest and refuel yeah. itself. And exactly. So it's <laughs> the, same, the same thing. Um, so you say that um, you have to redirect the no, right? When you get rejected. No. Can you guide us a little bit how you do that? 
Yeah. So one of the ways in which you can, you know, learn how to redirect a no is first trying to categorize your note and trying to understand what kind of note it is you're getting. And mm -hmm. so there's, you know, there's this concept that if you um, like of like ignoring no's. So some people say, oh, I don't even hear no. You know, when I when I hear no, it I just it rolls off my back. I don't even think about it. I keep on going. I don't know if that's always a good thing. You want to mm -hmm. hear the no. You want to hear the no because you want to hear the no and understand why the no. Why are you getting a no? You have to process the no. So if someone says they're not interested, you can go back in and say why, you know, or what are you looking for? Or what did you like? Or, you know, not be afraid to like push those questions. So in order to redirect yeah. something, you have to get more information about your no. So that you know what kind of no it is, why you're getting it. Is it a timing issue? You know, that kind of thing. And then that helps you to kind of process what to, what to do with it. But you got to get more information about no's. You cannot just say, oh, I just I just don't let them. No's just don't affect me. That's that's a, that is a great trait to have to not be to not allow um, a no to like hinder you, you know. Yeah. And then the other thing when it comes to like creating a yes is that, you know, in, especially in our business, there's mm -hmm. that the whole idea that if you keep pursuing something, if you keep going after something, you know, after 99 times, you'll eventually get your yes. And that I have found is sometimes just not true. Yep. And that sometimes your yes literally will not come until you actually create it yourself. And so that is something that as creators, we sometimes forget. We, we really do. Even though we're creative people, what happens is we start to we're good at sometimes creating projects and things. Right. Mm -hmm. But then we forget that we also have to go a little step further and possibly create the actual opportunity in and of itself. You know, whether that's like creating the actual platform itself, it's going to be on or, you know, like, you know, go ahead and pushing through all the way to do your fiction podcast, not just mm -hmm. coming up with the idea for a podcast, but actually going through and pitching it and not just doing one season, but doing three seasons. And exactly. you know what I mean? And like really taking things like further. I love that. Um, one thing that I always wonder, because I optioned a show, right? Um, I don't know. if I t Did I tell you that? Which one? I mean, you probably have Finding Grace. I have a million. I know. Okay. But it, it's it's uh, uh, Finding Grace, and it's a scripted. Okay. I can't. Yeah. I remember you telling me that. that yeah, yeah. It's a comedy. So to a producer, right? We uh, optioned it, and we renewed the option um, not um, long ago. So we are working with the producer. You know, they give us notes, and we rework. You know, the the not only the pitch deck, but the Bible. Uh, do you, when you did the movie, okay, did you get notes from the network and how did you deal with those notes? So, okay. So that movie, so what's interesting about that movie, A Christmas for Mary, was that it was a writing assignment. So I actually um, wrote that movie last year, just before the pandemic hit, I was hired to write it. Oh. And so, yeah, so it was, so it was crazy that I had to write it literally during the pandemic so it was it was so insane writing a movie it's like first of all writing a christmas happy go lucky movie while the world was literally burning down like on my street and i'm like there's a fire yeah, literally. and i'm writing about oh mary let me tell you what she does scene fading yeah. you know what i mean it was <laughs> <laughs> that takes a lot of talent girl <laughs> I had to read I and that. i said oh this seems a little too serious a little too deep angela no 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 like you know really but, so um so that was so but during that process i got the notes because it was a, because it was a writing assignment yeah. It was very easy for me personally to take the notes. Maybe I would feel differently if it was coming from me, like if I had created it from scratch, mm -hmm. but because it was an idea that essentially they brought me with a log line and said, this is basically our story. We're going to hire you to write it. And then I went from that that log line into a synopsis. They approved the synopsis, which was just like a paragraph. And then mm -hmm. after that, we went to a treatment, which was maybe about, I don't know, maybe it was like two pages or something. And then after that, then we went to the full script and we got some notes. I got notes on the first draft. And then because I was hired to write two drafts. So then um, I got notes for the first draft. I made those notes. They made sense to me and right. turned in the second draft. So because it was a writing assignment, I mean, I think really it's just my personality. Like I'm just one that like 
Um, it could be because I didn't go to school for writing. You know, I, I learned writing from reading books and studying scripts and watching movies and listening to the director commentary. So I think maybe an insecurity in myself is not 100 percent trusting myself and knowing everything. So I rely a lot on the expertise of the people that are hiring me or, you know, um, or whoever is on the team. Mm -hmm. So I'm always trying to help them execute whatever the best version of the script is. So I'm always happy to give a note. I'll speak of if something doesn't quite make sense or I'm like, are you sure you want to do that? Because maybe we should do this. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that instead. So I'm happy to like speak up if I feel like something just seems a little off. But um, but that was the process. You know, it was, it was pretty like painless and very helpful actually to nice. go through. And then to see the final and see like what was used, what was not used and that kind of thing. It was, it was a good experience. That's amazing. Well, you're very intelligent. You're highly, you're one of the you. most intelligent people I know. Oh, I need, I need to have that recorded and I'm going to play it for my husband. <laughs> Did you hear what Grace said about me? <laughs> he's a rocket scientist. I know, he's going to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure to have a rocket scientist husband. Right, right. You can see, you can see why I'm always looking for someone to validate my intellect, right? You can totally. see, hey. right? Angela, you can call me anytime. I will validate you in, in a very sincere and heartfelt manner. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, did they ever give you a note that you were like, oh my God, how can I tell them this is not going to work? And how no. did you handle that? No? They, they, no, I never got a note like that. And if I did, I mean, it would probably... If I got a note like that and I was being hired to write it, my personality is I would do the note and I would do it the best that I could. Yeah. And then I would let them see that it didn't work or okay. I would try to do like their note and then maybe try to give them another version of something of what I think they're trying to get at. Because sometimes, because not everybody is a writer, you know, executives right. are just giving notes off of their own, you know, intuition or their experience or whatever it is they want right. to see me. But they're not always writers, so they don't know like how you how I'm like um, processing that note. So mm -hmm. sometimes I'll try to read and say, okay, is this what they mean by this? Like maybe they mean this. So I might try to do like two separate versions and you know that okay. kind of thing. That's 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 probably how I would work. Just well, because also also for me, I think the opportunities are so far. Like I I feel like the opportunities are so slim. Mm -hmm. So when I got particularly this opportunity, I was like, I want this to be the best experience possible. Mm -hmm. I want to be easy to work with. I want to be someone that they come back to that they, that they want to hire again. Um, and so, um, and then also I just believe that the film businesses and just in general, our business is a very collaborative business. You know, the Oscars mm -hmm. are, on, are on now. And as we watch all those awards for all the different, you know, um, awards that are possible. There's so, it's like such a big industry. There's so many, you know, people that make a film or a TV show what it is, you know? So it's so collaborative. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. With all these brains, I'm, I'm realizing now that I'm collaborating with the producer and my partner, it's, it's just, um, yeah, it's very collaborative and you have to be humble. You know, we, yeah. we have to humble ourselves. Yeah. We Cause will. sometimes, yeah, because sometimes I'll be like, what? And then I'm like, like okay, yeah. chill out. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. listen, if you're putting it on their network or if they're paying for it and they're right. messing like, you know what? Listen. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe, you know, maybe what they think, it's it's going to work. I think in my case, it's because it is semi-autobiographical. Yeah, so it's a lot harder. Because you're like, that's not what happened. Or, yeah, that doesn't yeah. really make sense. So, no, that's, that's, that's definitely a harder, yes. I think, a harder thing. Yeah. It is, but definitely I keep the humble attitude because I am to be known as easy to work with because if not, people, you can be talented as hell, but if you're not easy to work with, nobody yeah. will want to work with you. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you might make less money. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Right. Yeah. Uh, totally. Um, so let me see. I Look, I'm so behind on my questions. Did you ever option any <laughs> shows? How's that process? Okay, Grace, keep moving. Yeah. Keep moving. Scrolling up, girl. Keep scrolling up. Uh, let me see. Oh, uh, you talk about this. This was fascinating because you talk about peripheral vision. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why peripheral vision? First of all, what it is. And second of all, why is it so important? 
Yeah. You know, I like to I'll share a personal story because I think that it's just easy to connect when you, you know, can see it from a very just a personal story is um, I was one time I was on an airplane and I was heading to Nashville and this guy next to me kept talking and he was just like talking, talking, talking. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I was really tired. And I was like, you know, I'm, you know, I have kids, so I'm like using this plane ride to go to sleep, right? I was waiting for my kids, right? And I was just like, this is my sleep time right now. And this dude yeah. is just nonstop talking. He kept talking about his ventures and entertainment, a, a video game, just stuff he was talking. And I was just like, who is this guy? Like, what, what is he? And I'm just like, you know, in LA, you meet a lot of people who are always talking about stuff they're doing. You're like, okay. Yeah. And then the um, flight attendant kept like kind of flirting with him, you know, and I thought, well, I kind of looked over. I said, he's married. So why would she be flirting with him? That's a little weird, but you know, maybe, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah, whatever. So I was, you know, he's a nice looking guy. So maybe, you know, she's just into him, but it was just weird. Like the way the vibe, she just kept coming back to hate me thing. And I was just like, that is so strange, but whatever. So I was just a little annoyed and kind of, you know, like whatever about him. And then when we got off the plane, um, it, the, the guy who was picking me up or no, when we were walking, when I was walking out the plane, people were like pointing like, Oh, oh, oh you know, and I was like, who is this guy? Who so is guy? I, was yeah. up, I was like, who is that guy? Why is everyone like pointing, taking pictures? He was like, that's Eddie George. I was like, who's Eddie George? He's like, Oh my gosh, Angela. And he was <laughs> like, he's a football player. You never heard of Eddie George, a football player. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't watch football. I mean, yeah. I don't, I mean, I'm just not a football. I'm not even a sports person. So unless you were like, the basic names of a, of the basketball team, like I do not know you. I'm so, with you. Yes, I have no clue, no idea. Yeah. But here's the thing: like at that point in time in my career, I was looking for funding for a feature film in that moment. And had I just like opened up my mind a little bit and not been so like, oh my gosh, in my own little head about who's this guy and you know whatever, and just really thought to make a genuine connection as he was trying to talk about his whatever, you know what I mean? I, we yeah. could have exchanged cards, and it could have maybe you know been just like a colleague that you know and help in some way or not but yeah. I think a lot of times we get so stuck on our exact purpose our exact thing that we want and we don't tend to kind of you know look to our right look to our left and see what all is there who all is there what all can we you know get done you know there are mm -hmm. so many students for example who are looking for internships who are looking for ways to learn and to um and to have you know someone to be able to write a recommendation letter for them you know for a program so i think people who are established entertainment professionals it is really a great idea for us to you know hire interns you know like yeah. putting a job on entertainment careers a job you know listing you know, seems, you know, even though it might be like a free internship, it might be something that can really help someone else while mm -hmm. also helping yourself. So sometimes we're thinking, oh, we need an agent, we need a manager, but maybe you don't, maybe you just really need an intern to kind of help you do some research or Ooh, help you. That's good. I like do that. Some things, yeah. you know what I mean? To yeah. like help you in your life that allows you the creative space to focus on your projects more or allows you the creative space to do more research on trying to get that next option deal. So sometimes the things we think we need, we really don't need. And like, you know, I go back to the career coaching because I do a lot of that. And I know people that have worked with like, I've worked with a couple different, you know, people from like actors, writers, producers, and directors in different capacities um, and different multi-hyphenates in which they were doing. And a lot of times when they are, a lot of times the person might have thought they really needed a manager or they really needed an agent. And that wasn't even what they really needed. What they really needed was to like finish the sizzle that they had, that yeah. they hadn't finished. Or what they really needed was to send some emails and or they really needed to go out and network or whatever, you know? So mm -hmm. Raphael Vision is just focusing on things that are maybe not like right, you know, they're not right ahead. They're just kind of like yeah. off the sidelines. And literally, you know, this person was next to you on a plane. Literally. Yes. Literally. I don't even know. I don't even know technically if he's like peripheral. I mean, because he was like right there. But I guess that is like, you know. It is. It's kind of like, right? Like, <laughs> well, like, can you give us, that was, you know, not the, the best uh, success peripheral vision. <laughs> but you well, have that was a fail. Okay. You just, <laughs> you just showed us how to fail do you think you could come up one that's a little bit more like you know yeah, like well i was gonna ask uh, was there any time in your career can you give us examples i'm sure you have a million examples but yeah oh my goodness most amazing example of 
you listening or like paying attention to your peripheral vision? Yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, I think when I gave the interns, that's a really great example for me because I I, I do that. So sometimes I've have mm -hmm. I've had moments in my life where I thought I really needed something, and I realized that wasn't what I needed. What I needed was to um, wake up a little earlier and mm -hmm. have the time for myself to execute X, Y, Z. So sometimes we think we need to even like, this is like super personal, but sometimes we might think we need to like diet, right? I might right. think I need to diet because that's like what the world tells you. Oh, you want to lose weight. Oh, you diet. Oh, duh. but maybe honestly, I just need to get some sleep. Like I just need to sleep more because if you sleep more, that also helps your metabolism. So there's just, you know, so like peripheral vision can literally be things that are like already in your wheel space to do but you aren't really doing them, you know? And if you do them, you will find yourself maybe being more productive with them. And then I think um, one of the best examples that I, I love, I, I share this in my TEDx talk is, I was reading The Hollywood Reporter. Um, this was several years ago when Tyler Perry had his very first movie, Diary of a Mad Black Woman, that Lionsgate, you know, aired theatrically. Yeah. And I was reading um, an article and the president of Lionsgate, the president of production at Lionsgate was quoted saying, that he they were looking for more films like this because they were shocked that this was like such a big huge success so i sent him an email didn't know him didn't have a contact to him i sent him an email and i just kind of acted like not that i knew him but i was just like hey i saw your article in the hollywood reporter about you looking for scripts you know for movies just like for scripts just like this um and i have one uh if you'd like to consider it i think i maybe put the log line um, and then in like 15 minutes or some short amount of time, I got an email back from him and he, he had CC'd his entire team and said someone was going to reach out to me. They reached out to me. They sent me a submission release form. I sent the submission release form back. I sent him my script and then they got right back to me like the next day or that week. They were like, we're going to pass, but we'd like to have a meeting with you. I went in. I had a meeting, talked to the executive. She told me. We just want to meet with you. We thought you had, you know, something to say on the page. You had a voice there, but this doesn't fit what we're looking for. But we just wanted to have a conversation. It was a great meeting. I learned a lot about how Tyler Perry got to Lionsgate. I learned about the Green Light Committee and what that means. And I just learned just like insider information that I would have never had had I not taken. Because when you read the Hollywood Reporter, that's your normal line of sight, the information that's there, right? Peripheral is saying, okay. What can I do with this that's beyond the page? What can I do with this contact or that bio you see? Right. If you can't afford to go to a, a film festival panel, peripheral vision is taking the bios and reaching out to the people that are at the at the real screen conference or at the whatever produced by conference. Some mm -hmm. of these conferences are super expensive. So if you can't take the time to, you know, get to all these places, you know, peripheral vision is taking a look and saying, going a deeper dive, how can I try to connect with these people in another way that fits within your, you know, your budget or your life in, in that way? Absolutely. And I, this, I know it's a cliche, this industry is all about relationships. And yes, and sometimes, you know, you meet with someone and, and you're not going to do business with that person at that moment. But in the future, you might connect, that person might be in another network or they might and might be the right time, the right place, right time. And that's when it happens, when a magic happens. So we have to be patient. Do you, are you patient as far as like, well, you're very think, persistent and consistent, you know, but yeah. are you patient? Yeah, I think so. I think you learn to be patient. Also, you know what, you gain a lot of confidence because what happened with me, which was something that, you know, I couldn't have predicted happened is when I sent that little email, just kind of like blindly, I, yeah. I did not think he was going to respond. I was less like, this is going to be like, what? And I was like shocked when I got the email back. But then yeah. I was like, okay, so if this worked for him, mm -hmm. this probably works for a lot of people. Like not that oh. other people are doing this, but it probably works if I did this with someone else. So then I tried it again and again and it kept working. It didn't work every time, but no, it did work a lot of times. And, and so then I was like, oh, this works. This is a strategy, you know? Absolutely. And some of these executives are more open and friendlier than you ever think. You know, like they're so nice. They're people. And they're people. Yeah, they're humans, you know, and they love it when you go say, thank you for the talk. It was great. I learned so much. So informative. You know, they want to hear your feedback. And, and that's what I love about breaking into Hollywood. You know, we can go and talk to these executives and, and give them, you know, praise and, and feedback and, and they love it. And then yeah. you cards and you, again, you email them and they respond. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, absolutely. So take risks. That's very important. Yes, risks risk are, 
you have to have, you have to be able to take risks, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know it's hard to do, but sometimes you just have to just close your eyes and just, and just go for it, you just know? Yeah. And, yeah. And just hit that send button, you know? And then once you, <laughs> and then once you do it, you're just like, and then eventually you just get used to it. And then you just send in emails all day long. I mean, I've literally emailed everybody and it's just like, it's like, it's, it's like no big deal, you know? So if I got an email from someone, I mean, I would still be like, wait, wait, what, what? Oh, Oh, they, you know, but pretty much, you know, there's so many people who are open in this business, oh, yeah. um, you know, so you just have to kind of put yourself out there a little bit more. And I think when you do that, you just, you just gain the confidence where when you're interacting mm -hmm. with people, you sort of fit in their, um, and their natural lifestyle. I always tell people like when they're trying to get an agent, when they're trying to query agents or they're trying to, you know, query production company executives, you have to fit into the flow of, of someone's email box. So if your email stands out and it's just like super long or it just seems too formal or something just seems like it, it doesn't belong there, mm -hmm. then it kind of gets dismissed. Um, but if it feels like it's it's part of your, you know, it's part of their inbox, they'll open it and be like, oh, wait, what? Oh, yeah. And they'll, they'll reply. Yay. No. Or whatever, you know, not uh, not everyone, but some of them will. <laughs> yes. And it, how how long are your emails? For example, give us an example. Is it one paragraph? Or you go sure, straight. No, through? no one paragraph. Short. Um, sure. Usually mm -hmm. very short. I would say like you only have like, you know what I like to do is I'd like to send emails. I, I mean, I don't do this now, but because now I just know like the proper length. But when I was trying to kind of decide, I would send the email to myself and then start reading it. And then oh. there is a part, you yourself are already annoyed. Like you're like, yeah, like, like I don't even know what I'm saying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because you start scrolling up and you're just like, uh, what? what you know and you just go like this is too much yeah. so i think if you send the email to yourself and you start reading it and you're just like oh my gosh this is way too much information and you just kind of get to your punchline you know what i mean like like um yeah. you know i when i um sent a query to my agent at a3 so i'm rep there as a as a tv producer and my email to her was are you looking for new clients? You know, that was my email. I said, Hey, are you looking for new clients? Cause this is what I have going on. You know, I just sold a show and I have another deal that's in the works. I would love someone to help me with this particular thing. And she responded back. Yes, I am. Let's, let's have a conversation. So that was like, I posed a quick question to her as opposed to like giving her the rundown of like, everything I did. I mean, I did say more in that email, but I'm just saying as opposed to like going on and on and on about your credits and, and who you are and where you came from and what contest you, you won and all those things. Um, at the end of the day, it was just like asking her a question that she could answer. Yeah, I'm looking. What do you got? That's, you know, That's great. That's amazing. Um, I, I love that. Very simple, straight to the point and just do it. Just don't be afraid. And we're going to make mistakes, you know, we're going to send an email that's going to be too long, too short, too yeah. boring, too much fun, too, you know, I mean. Yeah. You just yeah. got to keep trying. You're going to figure out what works for you, too. And I think that's yeah. the other thing, too, you know, and I think I, that's one of the things I like about you is because I feel like you have you have really just like watching you develop mm -hmm. and like change and shift and brand yourself. You know, you know who you are, you know what you're trying to do and you can see that. And so I think once once you sort of lock into who you are and what you're trying to do, and even if it's just temporary, it doesn't have to be like this is your thing for life. But yeah. it's just like this is your brand for the next three months. This is your summer thing. This is your this is your 2021 thing, you know, that you're going to focus on. And I think when you do that, people can see that people can see, oh, she's shifting. Oh, she's rebranding. Oh, things. are Oh, something's happening over there. Oh, yeah. hey, you know, and uh, and then people want to be a part of that. You know, yes. because that's just the natural how people are. They want to be a part of the moving train. You won't be sitting on the train that's just, just just chilling with ideas. You want to be on the train that's moving, you know? Totally. So do you think like changing, shifting all the time, uh, organically, of course, is better than just being one thing forever? <laughs> you know, like, you know this what? Is yeah. him, and that's it. I'm going to be I like this it, forever. Yeah, I think it probably just depends on the person. Mm -hmm. because I don't think everybody is like us, like you or I, I don't think everybody can, can like shift and you know what I mean? Like, I don't think everybody yeah. has that. I don't think yeah. everybody can do that. I think some people actually, I think some people who are wearing five hats need to just mm -hmm. wear one or two because they're seeing other people do it and they think, Oh, well, everybody can be a right producer director. Yeah. No, not everybody can do that. Well, some people can. And yeah. so I think you really have to figure out what you can do well and what works best for you 
you know, yeah. and then once you figure out what works best for you, then you know what I mean? Then it is what it is. But you have to kind of figure out your zone. And once you figure that out, then you kind of then I do think you kind of stick with that, you know. And for me, I like to do things in shifts because I have children. My summers are the children are off during the summer times. So then right. I create my projects and things. I create my life in a way where the summers I'm doing a certain type of like career in the summertime, um, the way I work with clients is very different than in the in the other part of the year or the way I'm creating projects, and things like that. So you know, I think we have to do what works for us. Me, I will say that I used to be the president of the Script Artist Network years ago, which is a great organization that I love, respect, and I think people should join if they um, are screenwriters. And so I remember I was in a, I was in a meeting and uh, a writer, a fellow writer had come up to me and they knew that I was like, you know, doing a lot, like kind of they, at different networking events and just kind of doing doing a lot of different things, saying I wanted to write, um, you know, a kids and then I wanted to write, you know, dramas. And I was just kind of all over the place and things I wanted to do, um, books and so forth. And this was early on when like doing all those things wasn't really like in now it's in to do everything. Right. Yeah. And so, right. And so she was just like, you know, I really think you need to hone in and focus, you know, because a jack of, you know, a master, you know, what is a jack of all trades is a master of none. You really need to focus was what her thought was. And so I remember asking my mom, I said, mom, what do you think about that? You think I should kind of hone in and focus on just being a screenwriter, like, and just focus on a certain genre and just like, what do you think about that? And she was like, not, no, I don't, because I've known you since you were a child and you've always had to do 10, 1100 things in order to like flourish. That is who you are. And you need that in order to survive. So for that woman, maybe just focusing yeah. on that thing was good for her. And some people, you know, you'll see someone who gets an Oscar, mm -hmm. someone who gets an Oscar tonight. When you look at their IMDb page, they might have directed all kinds of like movies in the same yes. genre or just done directing or just done acting their whole entire life. And that's the only thing. But then there'll yeah. be some other Oscar winners. They may have done film, TV, you know, and kind of done different things. So I think it's OK. Just figure out who you are. Absolutely. Know yourself. Number one, that's the, and anything you do, know yourself. Um, yeah, I always feel like I get bored just doing one thing. You know, that's why I like to do different. Yeah, producing, writing, uh, stand up comedy, acting. You know, it's, I love, it's it. I love that you do that. <laughs> I do. All kinds I love of it. <laughs> and it's always fun, I think, um, for me to create something new and to, like you said, to rebrand myself. And to be, um, I think it keeps people engaged as a performer. If if you change, either two things, if you change or if you stay the same, those are the two paths that I see that it works for people. Like constantly change like Madonna. Madonna always constantly changed, right? And then there are people that they're always, you know, doing just sitcoms and they're like the character actor in the sitcom. They have done nothing but that. So do you feel that that's, those are like the two paths. Is there anything in between or what, what do you feel? I feel that seems, that seems, that seems about right. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think also, it I think I would say it probably also depends on the level of success you want to have too, because okay. there's, you know, I think that's important to know too, because I know a lot of times where, when I used to be a talent agent, I was a talent agent for a couple of years yeah. and I managed actors. And I remember when I was signing on new clients, one of the questions I would ask actors is, you know, where do you see yourself in five, you know, five years or 10 years? Like, what is it you want to do? And a lot of actors would say, you know, I, I just really just love acting and I just want to perform. And, um, you know, I don't care if I'm really famous, but I just want to do the work that makes them happy. And for me, that didn't connect with me because I want the person that's like, I want to be famous, so famous that <laughs> like, you know, like I'm going to work so hard because yeah. they just didn't work for me. Now there's another agent who, if you said that too, they would, they wouldn't like the person who says they want to be famous. They want to, they like the person who's committed to the craft and the art and, and all of that. So, so when you're finding representation, you're trying to find people to match, it's all about personality. It's all about what that person perceives and things like that. But for, so I think with your question in terms of like changing and rebranding yourself, I think it probably depends on the level of success maybe you want to have. So I feel like, you know, if you want to have like grandiose, like big, big dream success, I do think that a lot of those people um, are either one of those two things. They're either constantly changing, like popping new hair colors, uh, yeah. popping this, popping that. All of a sudden, their Instagram is now a whole different thing. There, you know, I think there is a lot of shifting and rebranding and changing. Um, 
or it's just very consistently the same, you know, delivering the same stuff the same way and being consistent and showing up over and over again, consistency on time and dependable. And I think those are the two extremes that make it really big. You know what I mean? Like I that either financially make it big or a notor- notoriety. Maybe they're not making a lot of money, but we know who they are, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. I love it. Yeah. Um, so um, I have so many questions. We've been doing this for an hour and people are loving you. Look at this. Let's get some shout outs some some love. Angela is a terrific guest whose knowledge is so helpful to anyone. Thank you, oh, Mother. Thanks, Bernie. <laughs> that is so Thank cool. Thank you. Um, so what is, um, is, you think success is subjective? And, and what is success? What is the, a measurement of success? Yeah, um, I think it is. Um, I mean, I think it is subjective, but I think in all, our culture it, within America, success is, 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 success is, is either money, yeah. right? Status, power, um, or some version of that. And I think also maybe success is relationship-based, you know, um, so I think some version of those areas and reaching, you know, goals in those areas, I think, is what defines success. So yeah. I think it, it's probably very, very different for so many people. I mean, um, for me, I feel like, you know, that's a that's such a hard question because I just feel like success is basically um coming up with a goal and then like achieving it. To me, it's like, that's pretty much success. Like for me, it's like if I had a goal and I achieved it. And so that's why I'm really, really big on making um, realistic goals. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I know that also can be seen as like, I know like on a spiritual perspective, like my pastor, remember he talked about, I can't remember the acronym he used, but it's talking about like big, audacious, you know, big goals. Like if you basically are coming up with these little minor goals, like, you know, like God can do that. And I mean, God can do anything in a heartbeat, but it's like, why are you coming up with these small goals when you serve a mighty God? Right. So then it's like, you're supposed to be coming up with like big grandiose goals. Um, so on one side, I do believe in that, but I also feel like on the day to day, it's really important to come up with goals that you can control. So yeah. when I was like trying to get an agent, for example, um, I would, I wouldn't be like, I recently signed with a new literary agent and I years ago would have been like, okay, my goal is to get a literary agent. That's my yeah. goal. I mean, that's what I would be saying to myself. But when I'm now in times when I'm trying to do something like when I was trying to get a literary agent, I was like, okay, I knew I wanted to get a literary agent. Obviously that's like a goal in my head, but what I really focus on day to day is not that what I focus on is, okay, I need to send 50 queerly. I need to research 30 agents today. I need to, you know, watch, go on YouTube and search literary agents, giving talks. I need to know who's who, what's what, and finding what kind of agent would be good for me, finding out what didn't work for people, you know, going on Twitter, there's a lot of agents on Twitter and Instagram who have like hardly no followers and they um, are, you know, great resources that you could connect to like directly. And so, you know, so I think that's important, you know, to do as well. So you talk about inch stones and milestones. So this is what this is. Inch stones is like milestones or the big. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I've always been a, a, a fan of setting goals that are really even higher than I ever even dreamed of. And if the goal is here and I get up to here, then, if you know, because I set it this high, then I can get here. But if I set it this low, then I'm going to be here. And you're going to hear you there. No, I know. That makes sense. No, I make sense. And yeah. I think we have to, and I think, you know, I don't think everything works for everybody, you know? So we have to kind of figure out like what works for our psyche, what yeah. works for yes. us. And that's why it's so great. I'm a big reader. Like I'm a big reader. I just got a new book um, that just came in today um, called Don't Drop the Mic or something um, about your voice and leadership or something. But the point is, I'm a, I'm a reader. I read a lot of books um, from a lot of different types of people uh, across across all kinds of different fields. Like, you know, so I'm really big on that because I like to get ideas for how to think, how to live, how to function and just see what other people are thinking will work for them. I may not agree with everything. I may not agree on the side of what everyone thinks about, but I do think it's good to to understand different people's perspectives. And so, um, and so I think that's, that's something that's really, really helpful. So you have to figure out what works for you. I find that of the, of the people, of the majority of people that I have met in my career, 
um, whether it be like actors that were looking for representation or people that I have met that feel like they haven't reached the level of success that they're looking for. Majority of people, I believe, tend to focus on milestones. Day to day, majority of people focus on getting a co-star role by the end of the summer, um, booking four roles this month or getting callbacks or, or um, you know, landing an agent or getting investors or whatever the things are. Most people tend to focus on the milestones day to day. And so I think that is very, um, it can be very damaging and mentally destructful over time because okay. when you focus on things you can't control mm -hmm. and then you keep failing over and over again, that's going to start messing with your mind a little bit. And right. then you're going to start questioning yourself, wondering if you should stick with this and just wondering. So I think to avoid that and to really kind of celebrate your successes, it's important to yeah. create, you know what I mean? Those goals that are attainable. Um, and I also, I work as a social media professor at LMU. And one of the things we talk about in my class is creating smart goals, specific, measurable, mm -hmm. um, achievable, realistic, um, and timely and creating goals like that. And I think when you do that in any area of your life, when you get very specific and you find measurable, making something finite, like putting a time limit on it. Right you know, and, and making sure that it's attainable and things like that and and, um, and realistic and timely. I think those things can help you to putting a deadline to it. I think those things can be helpful. So, but, you know, everything doesn't work for everyone. But I think that's something that overall, I think most people tend to focus on the milestones. And I think if they spent more time focusing on sending the 50 emails out, because um, most people don't want to do that. They don't want to think about it. even sending 50 emails. It just seems like too much, you know, or researching the 50 people yeah. who the emails to. That's that's a whole week in and of itself. You know Absolutely. what I mean? You your, on your work schedule and things like that. So lots to think about. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And we could talk for hours and I have so many more questions. Maybe you can come back. And <laughs> yes. Yes. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us where we can get your book on Amazon and any. Yes, my book, Create Your Yes. You know, yes, show us your book. There it is. I love the cover. And it's like, I love it. Yeah, it's poppy. Um, yes. So Create Your Yes, it's available at Barnes and Nobles um, and Amazon and also um, Penguin Random House. So my book deal was with Source Books, but then Penguin Random House acquired the rights to the book for the audio version. So it's also available on, I believe, Audible. So you can also listen to it. And it's about an hour and 15 minutes or something. So it's an easy listen to read. And then I'm on social media, Instagram and Twitter, live with Angela. Excellent. So guys, follow Angela. She's amazing. Of course, you witness that Thank today. <laughs> uh, so get the book. It's a great read. It's amazing. It's very inspiring. And uh, definitely, if, if you can join Breaking Into Hollywood, I highly yes. recommend it. Highly recommend. Oh, it. thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you for for being on the show. I really appreciate. Oh, thank it. you for having thank me. You guys have a great you. evening. Thank you. You too. Bye, everybody. Okay. Chris, Marty, Jennifer, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Howard, thank you. Okay, last shout out. Wait, no, here. Uh, right here. Great show, Angela. Lots of insight. Thanks, Grace. Thank you, Howard, Howard, for tuning in. And thank you, everyone. And I'll see you next weekend, next Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Bye.